Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the folks that, who invited me to do this. I never have a strong oratory introduction to my talks. And what I would like to do, I think a historical society, you're probably well aware of Bellingham's coal mining history. For many, many years, it was the biggest industry in town. Uh, it was the first big industry. Uh, typically employed several hundred people at a time. And it took me many years before I randomly met a person who had worked in Bellingham Mine. And, and that started my interviewing people as I slowly uh, heard of people who had, had worked here. First started talking about coal mines, I'd actually occasionally get a person who had worked in the mine and then it became children who remembered a father that worked in the mine, and now it's becoming a generation further removed. So the Whatcom County had a number of coal mines of varying size. The ones that have names associated here were the bigger mines, and I have photos to go with all of those. There were a number of smaller prospects that, by and large, were not really productive, but had a little bit of work done on them. The first discovery was the Paddle Mine, uh, the location of this was not known with certainty until they accidentally bulldozed into the entrance when they were clearing the lot for the, the chrysalis spa is built down at Harris Avenue Dock. Uh, it became a major engineering problem to discover they had a water-filled coal mine running lengthwise across their lot. Uh, Merle Beck, uh, geophysics professor, we, we got contacted at Western, the engineering firm that was dealing with it wanted to know if we had any remote sensing way to tell where the tunnel ran and it was filled with water so you couldn't enter it. They hired a scuba diver who swam down a little ways where the roof started to break down and he swam back and said, no money is worth this. <laughs> they eventually got a video camera on links of plastic pipe and they ran it down hundred feet or so and the tunnel was still going and at that angle I thought okay so it doesn't matter how much further it goes and they did an elegant engineering job they drilled holes from above they poured a concrete plug and then they backfilled it with concrete up to the surface if you go to Harris Avenue dock just south of the dock there's a, a little viewing area it's got one single viewpoint bench the bench sets exactly over the top of the mine portal The Blue Canyon mine was actually about 1,000 feet or something up the hill above the lake level. They had a tramway down and then a terminal where they loaded coal on the barges and hauled it to uh, Blow Del Donovan, end of Lake Whatcom. Blue Canyon mine was quite complicated. The coal vein was folded. It, it, it wasn't uh, easy to, to stay on the coal seam. So they had multiple entrances and they kept losing the vein and digging in and trying to catch it somewhere else. Uh, it was a steep mine. It was very bad for methane gas. Uh, uh, there are a few photos of it. Interestingly, these photos all show different entrances to the mine. You can see the lunch buckets like I have. Several of them are carrying safety lamps. A lot of them are carrying safety lamps, probably because the mine was so gassy that they really worried about it. Uh, some of these miners are carrying the little teapot oil lamps on their helmets. These must be mine owners or something. There's no, no identification. They're clearly not miners. Possibly the guy with coveralls is a real miner. Yet another one here. You can see the big wood cars and the mule pulling them and again, safety lamps. This is the tramway terminal at the mine portals looking down the lake, cable running down, carrying buckets of coal to this coal bunker where in the later years they had the railroad in and they were loading railroad cars instead of loading barges. This lasted a lot of years. It burned. Does anybody know the date that it burned? I think 1970s. Here's the tug Ella and a loaded coal 
barge. Here it's, this is interesting when on this one, the, they're, they're towing a barge with the mine cars loaded on to, to the barge. The Glen Echo mine is out on the north side of Lake Quacom, uh, down by where Smith Creek comes in. Um, not much is known about this mine. It was discovered in 1920, but it really operated uh, around World War II times, especially right after the war. Um, there are no known photographs of this mine. Uh, there is this map, and it shows kind of limited workings. It was a difficult mine because the coal steep very, uh, the coal seems dipped at a very steep angle. What you'd like is kind of horizontal beds, and it was very inclined here. Uh, here's a more detailed view of the map and the pan rooms. Those are the rooms where they're really removing coal. Others are more like exploratory tunnels. Uh, in 1986, there were still some relics. The big geared hoist was the hoist cable that pulled cars in and out of the mine. My wife was sitting on the boiler that provided the energy for the operation. And the trough-like thing in the back was actually chute coming out of the mine portal. The mine portal itself had been covered by a landslide, but there were 25 coal cars that had been left on a siding. And then the forest around it was clear cut and they slash burned it and they burned up all the coal cars when they uh, cleared the, the, the logging slash. Uh, so this is 1986. I was here about 10 years ago and the only thing that was still visible was the boiler and the stream bed. The problem with the Glen Echo mine, and this is not it, but it's a similar height. The ceiling height of a coal mine is limited by the height of the coal seam. It's not economic to dig a taller tunnel because you can't afford to haul waste rock. So the Glen Echo mine had a ceiling height of about like this mine. Uh, not enough to fully stand up in. Um, but it could be worse. Here's a Kansas mine, and these guys have the flaming teapot lamps, but they're day is spent laying on their sides shoveling coal with little short picks. And to this day, we're still mining really low seam coal. It's more mechanized, but the, the height of the tunnel is always the height of the seam. And, and they will mine coal with ceiling heights of down around three feet. And in the old days of the British Empire, where coal mining was a huge enterprise, they discovered Women and children made really good mine workers because they were smaller than men. They could fit in the smaller tunnels. And they had hardly any economic value, so they hardly had to pay them anything. Really ugly time in mining history. But children uh, were used in mines in this country up at least, oh, I don't know what, 1920s or later. Uh, you see these kids, it's not like this is a real old-timey photo, but they're coming out at the end of the day's work, and three of them have safety lamps, and yeah, uh, interesting time to be a kid. Common kids' job, though, they were doorkeepers. The airflow is really important in a coal mine, and they will have wooden doors underground, and, and the kids would stand by the doors all day, and they'd open the door for the cars to be a full pull through, and, they, and then they'd close it. Uh, so it wasn't the hard physical work of mining. It was lonely, boring, uh, and very low paid. That's why kids were used. They didn't have to pay them much. Well, let's get to Bellingham. So the Seahome Mine was the first real productive mine here. Opened in 1853, operated not entirely continuously through 1878. So this muddy lane in the middle of the picture, that's uh, Elk Street in those days, now known as State Street. You can see the mine office, and then down on the bluff below was the original portal, and so Georgia Pacific could be on the landfill off to, just to the left of this picture. Coal was loaded on sailing ships, taken to San Francisco and sold, uh, went to various things. Uh, uh, steamship coal was a part of it, uh, part of the market for that mine. Today, we know where the portals were. The 1853 one was down on the bluff, above the Georgia Pacific parking lot. The other two entrances put in later uh, set underneath uh, one of the newer condominiums. And then the tunnels, they didn't go out under the bay. They went back under downtown, Railroad Avenue, uh, State Street area of downtown. 
We don't really have good maps of this mine. We don't really have any maps of this mine. We know the general area. So today, this is what it looks like, the 1853 original portal and then the plateau where the two higher portals were, were put in. The mine workings were very shallow. So here's, uh, uh, can anybody tell me what year that car is? 52? Well, anyway, you can see this was a breakthrough in the alley behind State Street in, into the mine workings. You're just barely believe, below the pavement level at that point. Problem is we don't really know where they are. So this, the, this is the, what became a Starbucks building. It was the, the pit, if you remember the story of the pit. It was considered as a possible downtown parking garage location. Uh, they knew the mine tunnels were not too far below, so they, they hired an engineering geologist to drill two holes. The historic record they had, they guessed they were 300 feet above the mine workings, but they hit water-filled tunnels at 77 and 83 feet. That was kind of the end of the possibility of a big heavy parking garage on that site. So the big mine was the Birchwood Mine. Bellingham Coal Company uh, operated it from 1919 to 55. This was the entrance gate. It's the only color picture I've ever seen of anything to do with the mine. It's a lot of black and white pictures. It occurs under the Birchwood District no Northwest Avenue area of Bellingham. You can see the little sea home mine downtown and the much bigger Bellingham coal mine. This is a general map. So it had um, an entrance by where uh, roughly uh, very close to the Salvation Army store uh, just off Birchwood. It ran underground in a straight line at an incline. The coal seam slanted about 11 degrees, so the main tunnel slanted at 11 degrees. By the time it got to below Marine Drive, it was about 1,200 feet below the surface. You commonly hear about Bellingham coal mines extending under Bellingham Bay. No mine extended under Bellingham Bay. Both mines were below sea level in terms of elevation, but they did not extend under, under the bay. And then the side tunnels, the 11 side tun levels, were where the coal was actually extracted. The dotted line areas there are the areas where coal was actually removed. So they would start on the first level, and then they'd go down and do a second, and they'd just keep going downwards. This is a city GIS map. It shows the extent of the workings. Okay, that's going to be it. The long pier that sticks out is the pier that, that goes out by the cement plant. It shows the extent of the tunnels and that honeycomb kind of network, the main incline. So there's about 200 miles of tunnel in this mine. So the room and pillar structure, the main slope was tracked with railroad track and steam hoist up at the top to haul cars. The side levels went off and had mule hauled cars out to the individual rooms. So in each room would be a pair of miners, and they would work the room out lengthwise until they intersected the next side entry level. So the, the squares that were left were the pillars that supported the roof. So they, they removed roughly half the coal and left about half of it behind. And it, it, an ultimate strategy is to start at the end of the side tunnel and, and harvest the pillars and then let the roof, the roof collapse. That was really never done in the Bellingham mine. They just kept going downward in the fresh coal, and they left the pillars. They, they made a brief experiment of pulling pillars, and, uh, and it, for some reason, was not access, successful, and they abandoned it. Uh, so here's a little excerpt of the main tunnel coming down. It's, it's actually a double tunnel. The side tunnels are actually double tunnels, and the reason for that is airflow. With a double tunnel, they had fan-powered air, so the idea was the air would circulate through the tunnel and come back through the parallel side. So almost all the tunnels were double just to give an air circuit. 
rooms that weren't being used, they hung up what was called bratis cloth. They were, it was like burlap curtains to block airflow in places where they were no longer actively mining. So here's the upper three levels, piece of upper three levels. You can see what an underground honeycomb the, the mine was. This was the initial construction of the mine. Uh, you can see inclined tracks going down behind that pile of dirt. That's where they're driving the tunnel down. They had about 200 feet of sand and gravel overburden to hit the coal seam. So they, they, they ran at a pretty steep angle and they just had kind of a temporary winch at that point. And, and then this is a closer up view. You can see the steep incline, double tracked incline going down. And so the initial tunnel came down at 30 degrees and then it hit the coal seam, which was a, a 10 or 11 degree angle. Um, and after a few years, they realized 30 degrees was too steep to efficiently haul, so they dug a second tunnel at a flatter angle. And so if you look close at pictures, you can see both slopes. They're hauling on the 18 degree slope, but the 30 one is still active. One of the things they used the 30 degree for was they, they used it to take bales of hay down to the horse barn. And it, it was also an emergency access if they ever had a problem with the main one. And by then, they've got the fancier building, the tipple, they call it, where they sorted the coal and washed it and got it ready to, to load on the rail cars to sell. Here's from the tipple, you can see the 30 degree incline and then the 18 degree incline. This is probably in the 1930s. These are miners' cars in the parking lot. You can see the main building in back, the Tipple Hoist House, mine office in front. This looks like a wood-framed house. Jim Pasco was the superintendent of the mine pretty much from start to finish, uh, all but the last few years. And he had a mining engineer degree that he got by correspondence school. He was working in Roslyn. They had a problem with the main tunnel. They hit what they call the quicksand la layer. They couldn't figure out how to drive the tunnel through it. And the state mine inspector said, oh, I know a guy in Roslyn. I bet he could figure it out. And it was Jim Pasco. And they brought him in. And he, he figured out how to drive the tunnel through the, the wet sand zone. And then he stayed on as the mine superintendent for many years. And, uh, if you want to hit the interview for this, here's a miner talking. All the miners remember Opie. Pasco actually was not a bad guy. It was his style of governing. Mm -hmm. He ran it by intimidation. Of course, he ran into World War II guys. <laughs> you don't intimidate us. Well, the Bellingham Coal Company was owned by the company that owned the cement plant in Concrete, Washington. Ninety-some percent of the Bellingham coal went to concrete used in the kilns to fire coal. The president was Perry Lucas, uh, uh, apparently a really nice man. The mine foreman for many years was uh, George Cormie, and then Jim Pasco, the superintendent. Bellingham mine was the best paying job in, in the area. This particular poster was actually advertising for scab laborers during a brief period where the mine was on strike. It originally was not a union mine, so it did go union in later years. I worked for the company 20 years, yes, total. I worked on top of the tipple area five years before I went down and started digging coal with a special, I'd say he was special, miner because he'd learned from the really good people. He was uh, an old Englishman, and boy, they knew mining. I got in with him, and I learned the right way to mine coal. All the details, he showed me exactly. To drill it, to, to load your holes, shoot the dynamite, and timber it, lay your track, load your coal, load your, your cars, and all that he taught me. So every morning at uh, uh, way pre-dawn hours, two fire bosses would walk all of the active areas of the mine with their little methane test lamps, and then they would come to the surface and pronounce whether or not the mine was safe to work that day. 
The inspector had a little lantern, about that big around with a little flame, and somehow he would go with that flame, watch it, looking for gas. There was rats down there. I know they didn't want you to kill any rats because the rats could smell the gas and run out of the mine. So the methane gas at Blue Canyon killed every miner on shift that day. Uh, it was, the headstone is still at Bayview Cemetery. One of the interesting things to me is the community response. Many of the mine workers were, were varying ethnicities, Central Europe and places. It was pretty international group. So when word came back to Bell Bellingham that they had this explosion that had killed everybody on shift that day, community people got in the, the boats and went to the site and gathered the miners' bodies, washed them, prepared for burial. One of the people who helped with that crew was the Bellingham mayor. So mines can have explosions for two reasons. One is the buildup of methane that seeps out of the coal. The fan systems try to keep that under control, uh, not always with success. This was actually a test blast done by the U.S. Bureau of Mines to test an idea that the coal dust itself was explosive. And it was spectacularly evident this is blowing out the port portal of a mine where they deliberately triggered a dust explosion. And in modern mines, they sprinkle lime over the surface to suppress the, the coal dust. So coal mine walls in modern mines are often white rather than black. Here they're scattering it by hand. Sometimes they would spray it with machines. The Bellingham coal mine had one accident, had one methane explosion, killed the fire boss that morning. Every miner ever after knew the story. Uh, here's one of them talking about it. They had an explosion down there. The, they used to send a man down early in the morning. I suppose he'd come to work probably maybe around 3 o'clock or so, and he'd walk all through the mine to see if there was any gas in it and see if everything was in, in shape for uh, in working order and so on, and then, and then he'd report. They'll never know what caused it, really, whether it was a... He threw a switch to start a fan and threw a spark, but anyhow, there was a certain amount of gas there that, that caused the explosion. Dust was always a problem in coal mines. The miners always said, especially right after they blast, how thick the dust would be. Uh, for reasons that are not clear to me, the Bellingham mine was not a particularly bad coal mine for black lung disease. It wasn't like it was exactly a healthy place to be, but I, I think partly the, the high ceiling tunnels and the efforts they made to have big electric blowers uh, tended to reduce the dust, but the, the miners all talked about that it could be very dusty at times, and here's one of them. We had two big fans that pulled the air right through the mine. Well, we couldn't, we couldn't have lived. After that, those fans go down, if the electricity goes off, you can't stay in there over 10 minutes. That's, that's the law. So this is a modern coal mine. I think it might be China somewhere. I'm not sure. Um, Modern miners, you can see how, how dirty they were from the, the coal dust that just got everywhere. They had a shower room. The miners paid a little bit of money every month to rent the use of the shower room. Uh, nothing was free. The miners were contract miners. They were paid by the ton, but they, pr they paid for their own dynamite. They paid for their own fuses. They paid rental for the shower room. They paid rental for the electric lights. It was still very good money, but... Uh, 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 Nothing was free. So this is the Bellingham shower room. This is a shower room elsewhere, but it shows the baskets they use, and you can play Bill Wigley's description of how they work. You, you come to work in your street clothes, and then you went into what we call, a, I think it was a shower room. It was a, a round metal basket, two, two metal baskets on a chain. And you take your clothes off, put them in this basket, Pull on a chain and your work clothes would come down, and the good clothes would go up, your clean clothes. So you put your old working clothes on, 
And then you'd pick up your battery pack and your helmet and go get on your lunch bucket and get on what they call the man train. So the man train had little sloped benches. The benches were set at an angle so the, mine, so the upper surface was horizontal. So they were designed specifically for the incline of the tunnel. This is one, one at Roslyn showing a close-up, and you can hear Bill talking about riding the train. Going down the slope, I'd get on the back seat of the car on the corner. I figure if some cable broke, I could bail out. <laughs> Coming up, I'd be in the front seat on the corner. If something broke, I could bail out. I had that figure, not so two seats I'd go going out come back. So when you see pictures of people riding mine cars, these are mine tourists, they're not miners. They didn't want to break in in the middle of the shift to put on the mine cars, so visiting groups, they just put them in coal cars. So this is some Kiwanis Club or someplace on an underground tour of the mine. Here's another one, Jim Pascoe standing by the mine car, all wearing their suits. Here's miners coming out at the end of the shift. They're going to go turn in their lamps to get them recharged, and they're going to go to the shower room and get washed off, go home. The hoist was a big steam-powered hoist. Pete Sanuti was the engineer, the whole history of the mine. The clock dial thing in the middle was how he could tell where the cars were. And the length of the tunnel was so long, it took more than one revolution. So it had a small dial and then a big dial, and you had to read them both to know where the cars were at any point in the mine. And they, they used whistle signals or bell signals, uh, uh, kind of like a Morse code system, to communicate back and forth between the hoist man and the miners underground. So this is hand drilling with the kind of drill bit that uh, I showed. Uh, Bellingham coal mine by then was using jackhammers and a more conventional modern style of drill bit. But for years, this drilling by hand was the way it was done. This is done with a small compressed air drill. It's not the Bellingham mine, but it, it, it kind of shows how drilling could be. And then once they drilled a pattern of holes, they'd put in dynamite, set it off, and uh, do the Bill Wegley one first, please. We would drill into the face with big hand jackhammers and then load them up and then blow the face off. And, and when they'd blow the face off, we'd get back and then whammo, he'd blow the face, and then we'd get a hell of a headache for a little bit there from the dynamite. Some of the nitroglycerin fumes, you know, the active ingredient in the dynamite. Well, let's, let's hear Barney. Put me in as an extra man with this fella. And I've been working with him about a month. He drilled this hole in a solid piece of coal, and he put four sticks of dynamite in it, and had it all ready to go, and the neighbor next door grabbed the wrong wires, grabbed our wires, and fired that shot, and it killed him. Killed my partner. In 1924, they experimented with one of these undercutting machines. It's kind of like a big chainsaw that cuts a groove at the bottom of the seam. It was an alternative to using so much dynamite. It was not very successful. They had a roof cave in that covered it up, and they never bothered to dig it out. This is a couple of them at the museum at Roslyn. You can see the snaggly teeth, the, the chainsaw-like architecture of them. Setting timbering was very important to support the roofs. The Bellingham mine was nice to work in because the coal seam was generally eight or nine feet thick, so lots of headroom, but it made it hard to, to, to timber such a big opening, and you can hear Bill talk about. Every, every miner that worked in the mine that I talked to said the hardest job was timbering. We'd pick a hole in the coal to get to, so it would set, you know, just a little pocket. And then the collars went up. I don't know how we got them up there, but all by hand. I, you know, when you're lifting up maybe a 12-foot, uh, at least a 12-foot long green fur, 8 and 10 inches in diameter, that's, you've got some weight. 
Yeah, you said on the phone it hurt your shoulders. Oh yeah, my I even went to the unemployment and showed them my shoulders. That <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not big, so I, I they said if you quit, you can't get unemployment. So I had to work, keep working. You can see here. This is one of the main tunnels. You can see how much timbering went into the mine. Visitors group, obviously. So uh, checking the ceiling was always a critical safety thing, and miners were responsible for their own safety. As contract miners, they were responsible for deciding what they needed to do to, do to keep their rooms fit, uh, safe. Let's hear Milo. They had had a small cave-in, and they needed somebody to get over on the other side. And so this one guy volunteered to, to go, go over the top of the cave-in on the other side. Well, while he was going over the top, well, small rock come falling down and crushed him. And every time there was any, an accident or someone got hurt, well, they, had, well, they would have a safety meeting. So, and, and figure out the cause and figure out the reason why and, and uh, how it could be prevented. So, mining is always somewhat dangerous. The Bellingham coal mine, as coal mines go, had, had a good safety record. They had some fatalities. They had broken bones and other in injuries. Uh, but uh, superintendent was very safety conscious. I talked to his son. He said that if there was ever an accident in a mine, his father would never talk about it at home. It was just a, it was too tender of a subject. And they really strived to be safety conscious, and, and the miners were uh, aware of that. Let's hear Hal James talk about shoveling coal. The uh, standard output for a couple of hardworking and experienced miners was eight cars. Each car uh, um, uh, held about two tons, so the, output, the, the day, uh, daily output per man, per uh, place, was uh, 16 tons. So the miners got paid by the number of coal cars they filled each shift. So doing eight cars a day between the pair of miners, that was considered the norm, but it was bragging rights if you could produce more than that, and, and you got paid by the ton. So miners, they really didn't take a lot of breaks and stuff because they just really wanted to keep shoveling coal. We really didn't have a lot of, and that's one of the reasons we like working there, was we didn't have a lot of immediate supervision. We were on our own down there, providing we knew what we were doing. So almost everybody that I'm showing in interviews is no longer living. Uh, Dutch Galenzi died a year or two ago, um, and I misspelled his name. It's not Vonner, it's Vern, but he went by Dutch. Uh, he became a high-ranking sheriff's officer in, 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 and worked in the sheriff's department for a year. Just the nicest man. I, I by and large, liked everybody I interviewed, but I, I, I particularly liked it, it took years for me to find a picture of one of the mules or horses in the mine. I, I got these fairly recently. In the early years, they used mules to pull the coal cars. In later years, they went to horses. I, I heard because uh, it got hard to find mules locally, so they switched to horses. It's hard to see in the blurry picture. The mule has a light on his chest harness. The guy's headlamp is blurred from the long exposure. I always ask miners, did, did the mules have lights or not? Some of them said no, some of them said yes, but this picture clearly shows that at least in this era, the, the mules did have their own lights. A mule learns pretty fast. He knows just what to do. And they're most trustworthy, they're the best. Well, some guys abuse their mules and horses, you know. Well, that's not the way to treat an animal, really. Talk to them. You can talk to an animal, and he's pretty soon he's your friend, especially a mule. This is the underground mule barn, and the mules and horses would, would spend their life there. When they got too old to work, they would be taken to the surface, and I have a story upcoming of a miner that brought a horse home to put out the pasture at his farm. Everybody said they were really well cared for, uh, and uh, 
two clips of Ed Moroy, who for many years was the underground foreman of the mine. And you can play those either order. You know, you take them drivers. They thought as much of their mules as they did of some of their kids. And we had the best of food, no doubt about that. The best grain that would go in every day, fresh and heavy. And there was a man that done nothing but clean them when they come off at night, brush them off, feed them. So when they come in, they turn them loose in the man way. They turn them loose there, they'd go right on up to the barn, between the second and the third level. Because this man was there right ahead of them, and he had everything all fixed up. And sometimes, some of them would come to their mule, would give them a chew tobacco. And that mule looked for that chew tobacco every day, or by gum, he wouldn't get out of that stall. This picture is interesting. If you look close, the miner has brought his young son to, to work to see where he works. To some extent, being a coal miner is kind of a, involved the whole family enterprise. And I remember talking to uh, Walter Johnson, who worked in the Bellingham coal mine for quite a few years in the 40s, but he told me that Every day that when he went to work, his wife would pack him a, a really big lunch. They had a garden and they had some fruit trees and stuff. And he, he said that, and he worked there probably the best part of 10 years, but he said every day his wife packed him this really big lunch so he'd have extra food in case he got trapped that day. And he said he never got trapped and every day at the end of the shift he'd feed his second lunch to his mule. So at the surface, the coal was sorted in the different lump sizes. The dust was washed out of it. Uh, it was a mechanized operation, this shaker table. Um, I've never been able to find any photos except for this one of that coal sorting operation at the tipple. Uh, and I never had an interview taped of anybody that worked into a, in it. I, I really wish I could catch that part of the picture. Traditionally, that was a done-by-children job. The, 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 what they called breaker boys, breaking up big lumps of coal to manageable size, picking the rock fragments out of it. Uh, it involved exposure to drive belts and gears, and they were just maimed all the time, but they were considered temporary. They weren't paid much, and there were always other kids waiting for the job. These are breaker boys. You can see how young they were. And again, in addition to child labor, women worked cheap. So in, in I think this is an English picture, uh, you know, housewife types that had no economic value on the labor market uh, or, or daughters uh, would, would have this job. The little short picks, they're breaking up big lumps of coal to get them the marketable size. Well, Bellingham Coal Mine had a really nice work history uh, the, the management and the mine workers consistently got along. It had a reputation for safety, a reputation for uh, this kind of cooperation between the workers and management. And almost every miner that I interviewed looked fondly back on their experience in the mine. Uh, they said it was interesting work. They said it was very well paid. They all said it was very physically hard. But I, I, I heard many, many positive stories of people looking back at, at their mining years as being a really good part of their life. A little bit of coal was show, sold locally for burning in wood stoves, but most of it went to the cement plant. The, one of the things the miners really remembered is in the Great Depression era, the demand for coal really slacked off, and the, the mine management made the decision they would not lay off any workers. They would share the hard times equally, and all of the miners remembered that forever after. They said for a while, business was so slow that, that it, it didn't work to work just one day, but it, they said for a while that they would work two days every two weeks. But the miners all remembered that no miner was, was laid off during the Depression. And here they're loading coal onto rail cars, Bellingham coal trains way back when, very small time to what we talk about today, but these are headed for concrete Washington for the cement plant. 
And then the building of Grand Coulee Dam in the late 1930s just overnight practically changed the mind. The demand for cement skyrocketed. The demand for coal to make cement skyrocketed. Bellingham Mine went from this working two days every two weeks to working three shifts a day. The mine just completely turned around and, and it became a booming operation. It stayed that way for quite a while. The old tradition was it was unlucky to have women underground, but the Bellingham coal mine consistently invited wives of miners to go underground on occasion and see where their husbands work. So here's a woman waiting to go underground. Here's a bunch of women in early earlier year, era waiting in their dresses and their headlamp brackets to go underground. Here's Vera Johnson, who's the one who packed a double lunch for her husband. She's the one woman I talked to that had been on the underground trip. But here's Jim Pasco leading another group of women. It was a regular feature. Uh, Opie is a very colorful guy. You can hear his story working in the mine here. So did your, did your wife, did she worry about you working in the mine? Did she worry about you getting crushed or caved in or blown up or whatever? Yeah. A man can't get inside a woman's head. You don't know what the hell they're thinking, really. I felt that she was concerned. Mm -hmm. I damn near got nailed a couple of times, you know. And uh, I was in a cross cut, and I thumped the top, you know, and boy, it sounded solid. I took over there left, and I said, oh, screw it. Normally you'd finish it up. And I thought, oh, the hell with it, and I stepped back, and the whole goddamn roof come down. So here's a Kiwanis Club group in 1925 having a, a tour of the mine. Uh, most of the mine pictures were taken by newspaper reporters for these special events. The, you think of the pre-electronic flash days. They were using trays of flash powder. It was a real fire hazard. Uh, the miners themselves were not allowed to take pictures. It was not easy technology to do in those days. They were also not allowed to wander around in the mine. They were, for safety reasons, were told to go to their workplace, do their work, come back, catch the car to the surface. Uh, they didn't have uh, freedom to just aimlessly wander. So these press photos, good news is they're pretty good quality because they're, they're, they're big four by five sheet film negatives, but they're mostly special events. Here's one, you can see the chef, you can see the Chinese lanterns hung for the decoration. Uh, clearly not a typical coal miner gathering. Here's one, you can see the tea set, you can see the musicians playing, they're having an underground dance apparently. And again, you can see how heavy the timbering is on, on the main haulage tunnels. Here's another, this was probably the same one before with the paper lanterns, but you can see the band. So in the very final years, the mine was kind of going bankrupt and it, it was purchased by new owners and they attempted to automate the mine uh, instead of using hand miners uh, and instead of using mules, they went more to machinery. Instead of the mules and horses, they used this little electric locomotive. In back are the flywheels for the, the big steam engine that was still running the, the hoist. And they bought one of these automated miners, what they call the miner mole, made by the Joy Company, and big carving teeth that cut into the coal and had a conveyor belt that carried it back and it loaded it through a chute into the coal car so you didn't have to shovel the coal. The only problem, these were tremendously expensive and they only had one, so it could r work in one room of the mine, but the other rooms they still had the pairs of miners working by hand. Here's another picture of a, one of the mining moles carving coal. And there are a few pictures in the Bellingham mine. So here's, uh, this guy I think was a foreman at that time, uh, and the carved face. Actually, the, 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 the snaggle teeth of the machine can be seen in this picture. They're hard to make out, but it's the mining mole cutting the, the face. They still need timbering to hold the roof up. Here's what the face looks like after the mining machine has carved into it. You can see it's still as dirty an operation and the guy's battery pack on his belt. Here's the other end of it, the conveyor delivering, delivering the coal into the coal car. 
uh, John Pasquin was the superintendent that last few years. Um, and they're clear down at m level 11. That was the level they were at when the mine closed. And again, the conveyor loading coal. Glenn McBride, after the mine closed in 55, became a Whatcom County barber for many years. The mine site now looks like this. It has apartments built on top of it. So let me back up just a little. Um, so I had the chance, one of the last interviews that I got was a, a guy that had, actually two guys that had worked in the mine at the time it closed. They said the, the mine was, they were, they were so financially shaky. What put them under was all of their coal was going to the concrete, concrete plant concrete plant closed for a month or two to do a big renovation. It left the mine without any market for its coal during that period. They, they had no operating money left to tide them over. And the thing that put them under is they were skimping on maintenance. And so in the, in the main, that 18 degree haulage tunnel going down, uh, there was kind of an unstable zone and the, the roof began to collapse. The miners told me when they got to that point, they had to bend over, get their belly down over their knees to get low enough so their heads wouldn't scrape the ceiling. And, and one day they went to work and the, the tunnel had collapsed and the mine never reopened. And I saw in the paper, I thought, you know, this must have been a big news thing, collapsed that closed one of Bellingham's biggest employers. And I looked in the back issues of the Bellingham Herald. There was no mention of that. But several weeks later on the financial page, there was a mention that the mine was trying to get the Small Business Administration to give them some emergency funding so they could reopen. They wanted to buy another one of the automated mining machines. They wanted a good bit of money, uh, which they didn't get. But in their application, it said the total financial assets, to total financial bank assets of the mine at that point was under $100. So the mine never reopened. And the last few slides just are kind of some recollections of some of the miners. Ed Maroy was the, the foreman for many years. His accent is kind of interesting uh, because he, was, he came over as a kid from Belgium, and you could always hear the Belgian accent a little bit. So let, let's hear him. Yeah, a lot of them said it was a hard life. Well, I'll tell you, under the same condition, I'd go right back again tomorrow. Go all over again. I always made a good living. And very well satisfied, you know. When you're mining coal, you're really your own boss. Nobody bothers you. You're there on your own. I, I enjoyed mining. I didn't like the hard work so much, but I enjoyed it. I did one horse out of the mine. It was a good horse too, but it had a it had a, it had a bad foot. But it didn't bother it any. Uh, it might have bothered it in the mine where the surfaces was harder and it was rougher, but it didn't bother it out on my farm. I used it quite a bit. I, I remember it was eight hours from the time we left the surface. We had to be back up in eight hours. And uh, when we go down the slope, it'd be snowing like heck. And of course, it's pitch black or in hell when you're down there and you don't see nothing until you come back up. I asked Melvin, what did we get? And he said, $3 an hour. Well, man, that was big money back in them days. It was uh, really interesting to me because I was young enough and I wanted to learn. And these fellows showed me things that some people will never even think about, maybe. Anyway, I did get in really enthused and in, in fact, several times the superintendent came to me and say, said to me, if you like a different job, I can give you something else to do. Get away from mining, working so hard. No, I said I'd rather stay mining. Besides, I like to dig coal and shoot and blast the stuff out the way I learned to do it. So that's the reason that I stuck with mining. Besides, I always knew that I could make enough to get at least enough groceries so the family could get by. 
foreman and the uh, and, uh, superintendent both, when I quit that day, for good, they shook my hand and they said, Lord bless you, and I hope you make it okay, you're leaving us, and you got a good job. I said, yep, going to shipyard. They said, well, I hope you have good luck. Come back when you want to come back. You always have a job. So I owe a big debt to the museum, particularly Jeff Jewell and the photo archives, uh, but also a lot of other people that came up with pictures or other materials that I used. Uh, there are some coal miner interviews at the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies that are open access. Galen Byrie recorded most of them. And then uh, these are the people that I interviewed. And the last slide, you can hit the sound on that one when you're ready. My dad was a miner. He was born on a homestead near the Colorado-Kansas border. And his father died of a heart attack in his early 40s, leaving 11 children. The older kids dropped out of school to go off to make their way in the world to try to make money to send home to support their mom and the younger brothers and sisters. My dad dropped out of the eighth grade and at 14 went to make his way into the world. Uh, at 16 he got a job in a Colorado mine and for the next 10 years he wandered through the western United States working in gold and silver mines up until going into the army in World War II. I know that he saw those years as hard times, but he saw them also as times that were a great adventure and uh, really a good time in his life. I wish now that I had listened more to the stories he told of those years. Um, I won't have that chance, but I'm glad I've had the chance to hear so many stories of the men who worked in the Bellingham coal mines. So that's my show. Thank you. Uh Thank you. <clears throat> Once some years ago, we had um, David Morse at our house for lunch, and he said once one of his workers came in from a warehouse, said, Mr. Morse, Mr. Morse, the floor caved in, and an old car went down, and that was their discovery of the CO mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when I came to town in 1956, you could look right down into that, uh, attic, that tunnel. There was water down there about 10 feet down. So I don't know that it's true. I heard a story that for a while Morse Hardware used that mine to dispose of their garbage. <laughs> if you want to know a place that is on top of shallow workings, it's Bellingham Farmers Market. And there was one place that had a big sinkhole that they dumped lots and lots of cartloads of material in to, before they ever finally got it filled. And what sets on it today is Bob's Burgers and Brew. You interviewed several of the men there about their experiences in the coal mine. Did many, if any, die from black lung disease? Not specifically. Um, the mine had a long tradition. If, if a father worked in the mine when his son got 18, his son could work in the mine and he would be paired with his father as an apprentice. Uh, sometimes kids went in and were paired with other miners. It didn't have to be your father, but the father-son thing was fairly strong. And so that meant that the fathers sometimes had spent many, many years working as coal miners. And I never heard a specific black lung story. I did hear a couple of guys saying, well, you know, by the time my dad got in his 60s, you know, he was starting to move slower and being shorter winded and stuff and you know that that could have been heart stuff or anything. I was able to speak with uh, Pete Snooty when he was still working at the drugstore. Did, were you able to talk to Pete? I never also? did. I really missed the the Snooty family. They were mm -hmm. hugely important in the mine history and I I, I did not interview them. So I, there is a, a, a really good Galen Byrie recording of Pete Snooty Sr. That, that I have heard but 
I, I know you have some ties with that family. And what about the a geologist um, that went to the coal mine um, hearings? In the early 50s, I think the coal mine was sued for improper closure, and uh, one of the geologists from Western was yeah, there. Yeah, that was Don Easterbrook. So there, were, there, there was a suit in, in the mid-1930s by property owners in the area over around Jaegers that sued the mine claiming damage, cracked foundations or subsidence depressions in their yards. They, they won the suit, the mine appealed it, took it to a, uh, an appeals court, and they lost there. The mine claim was that those tunnels were open. They said underground, they couldn't see any, any collapse or anything underground, and they denied any responsibility, but they did lose the, the suit. But that was at the time when they were up in the upper levels. I said that the, the, the problem, the mine had 200 feet of overburden before you hit the coal, and that was a pretty good buffer against subsidence problems, but the problem there is the Squalicum Creek Valley cuts 100 feet into that 200 feet, so there are some areas in the early days when they were mining pretty close to the surface. Uh, the closure issue was when the mine was, was closed, um, they brought in some loads of gravel and they, they dumped gravel down that uh, 18 degree incline, filled it up to the surface. And, and then in later years, the question was raised, well, how do you know the gravel just didn't run down the slope? How do you know it formed a plug? What they should have done is what they did on the paddle mine many years later. They should have put a, 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 a plug in the mine and then fill to the surface. But instead, they just dumped gravel on it. And, and so the degree of filling of that mine has never been established. The case was kind of dismissed in a arbitrary way by a judge that didn't have any patience for listening to the argument. And uh, to this day, we don't know how well that tunnel is filled. It does have long history now of paved parking lots and buildings and stuff built on top of it, and it hasn't had subsidence problems. So many years later, it, it apparently has turned out to be okay, but it was not a, not a good engineering fix at the time because nobody, nobody worried about the gravel running down the slope. The tunnels collapse pretty early. The, t the timbers rot, the ceilings collapse, and the, the, because the volume of broken rock is greater than solid rock, when the tunnels collapse, it fills the tunnel and hundreds of feet higher, there's really not any surface expression. So the, the, you know, the 200 miles of tunnel underneath North Bellingham are probably no safety hazard at all. The old Seahome mine underneath the, the main downtown area is potentially a problem because we don't know where those tunnels were. We know they were shallow and the drilling that they did there on that Starbucks property, uh, interestingly they hit at the about 80 foot level, they hit open tunnels, they hit water filled voids, so the tunnels there apparently had not collapsed. And to this day we have very little idea what's under downtown Bellingham and about all you can do is site by site drill to see. Thank you.